Hey everyone, Chris Gio here, coming to you from Beyond the Veil. I wanted to talk briefly about the bootstrap paradox. And for some reason, my phone wasn't letting me um, stream to Facebook, so I figure I'll just record a quick video. But um, I've been getting into time travel lately. And I know it sounds strange, but I feel like this next activation site is going to involve an element of time travel consciousness transfer from this time space into another time space to accomplish something or retrieve some information or do something. I don't have more information on it as of yet, but um, it will require um, something like that, which uh, from what I gather, it's going to be intense on the body as well. Maybe it's because the disconnected state in which um, we will find ourselves in will be much larger or longer than uh, what we experienced within the pyramid. And within the pyramid, I almost died. As a matter of fact, I did, but I was able to come back to my body. And uh, perhaps this is why the message has been, get your body in order, get your body in order, because um, the amount of whatever we take, ayahuasca or whatever, um, in order to achieve these states is probably gonna be very taxing on the body. So, um, I'm still waiting for more information as far as that goes, but uh, I've been wanting to do some shows about time travel and um, really try to understand this concept. And uh, the reason I wanted to put this video out is to get uh, you guys and gals out there to leave a few comments about time travel and um, its possibilities and uh, maybe bring a little bit more insight into what potentially needs to be done if I am accurate in my analysis of what needs to be done at this next site. So the bootstrap paradox is something that uh, was very interesting. It came up on the show yesterday with Seven and Aset. We did a great round table. It's over at youtube.com slash beyond the veil. Please check that out because it's just mind-blowing information and um, the energy field that the four of us were creating was really something unique. But um, when it comes to the bootstrap paradox, what this is, is um, a paradox within the time stream that allows something in the past to happen when it's brought in from the future, but it doesn't exist in the past. So um, the example that they gave uh, when I was watching this video was as such. Let's say you get up and you receive a package. And within the package is a book about how to build a time machine. So you look at the book and you finally build this time machine. And then you get the bright idea, well, let me get into my time machine and let me go back into the past and deliver this book to my previous self um, and in order for my previous self to build a time machine. Well, that um, book now is considered uh, the bootstrap paradox. I don't know why it's called the bootstrap paradox. Maybe some of you can uh, enlighten me there. But the premise of it is that the book didn't exist until the future, but it was brought back to the past, but then you brought it back to your previous self. So at some point in the time stream, there has to be a starting point where the book exists within the, in the past. But without the book existing within the past, your future self can't build a time machine um, to take it back to the past. So that book now is an anomaly within the time stream. And um, the way that they reconciled this is that perhaps you're not actually traveling from the point of the future back into the past, into the same time stream past but rather you're traveling into an alternate universe and going and, and creating, um, bringing the book from one timeline into another timeline into the past. So now you have two consecutive timelines happening at the same time. But um, it was a pretty fascinating concept and one that uh, I understand how it could be a paradox. Now, the other question was, well, what happens to the integrity of the book as it's looping endlessly within this time space? Because the book exists in the future, you take it back to your, your past, right? And then that book gets deterioration and uh, other types of damage between then and the future. 
and then you take it back to the past again. And so once that cycle is looped over and over again, well, what happens to the damage in that book? So does the book, when it appears in the past, does it maintain the condition of its original condition? Or um, is it affected by the endless loops of being brought back and forth and back and forth and back and forth from the time space? So that was another pretty interesting um, anomaly that was uh, portrayed within this bootstrap paradox. And um, the, the, the conclusion of this particular video that I was watching is uh, Einstein's conclusion, which you can travel into the future, but you can't travel into the past, at least not in the, in the same time space that you were traveling in. But yesterday, Aset brought up a really interesting dream. She said, uh, you know, last night, which was the night before last, she said, I had a dream that Chris visited me and he put me inside of this bubble. And he said, where would you like to go in the time stream? And she said, 1492, right off the bat. And uh, I, she didn't elaborate or expand upon the dream after that, but uh, apparently there is some time travel um, ideas that other people of the tribe um, are experiencing as well. And I'm directly involved in this in the astral, which kind of underlines my my idea that there's some kind of consciousness transfer through the time stream that needs to take place. But 1492 was a very interesting time because 1492, there was a huge plague in Egypt. But 1492 BC was the time of Tetmos the first. And um, this was the time when Egypt started to really just fluctuate rather than being stable. It fluctuated up and down. Now, Egypt, as uh, we have pointed out from our experiences there, is the center point of the matrix. It's like the battery. And the Nile River um, keeps the current flowing. You have uh, the Philae Temple, for example, and it may not necessarily be Philae Temple itself, but the monuments down there were acting as the positive charge, and that's why they were calling it Upper Egypt. And the pyramid was acting as the negative charge, and they were calling that um, Lower Egypt. Oh, I think they are coming to take my car. No, they're not. Okay. I'm waiting to get my uh, tire fixed. Um, it's got a slight little leak in it, and they said they would they would uh, patch it up. They said they would do it for free, too. I was like, really? So it's pretty cool of them. Um, but anyways, so Egypt is a battery, and um, they created that high dam there. And this was something that we brought out of the Temple of Hatshepsut, was the high dam is creating huge problems for the energy flow of Egypt. And I started getting visions of palm trees and an oasis around the pyramids, and come to find out, up until like, I want to say the beginning of the, the last century, I want to say around the 20s, 30s, maybe even 40s, Egypt had water. The Nile came all the way up to the pyramids. And then I'm finding old photos with um, palm trees. I think that's them actually coming to get me. Uh, no, it's not. Okay. Um, so we saw we saw these palm trees everywhere. And we're like, oh, wow, okay. So this was a completely different, different terrain. Then when we started asking around, we started asking about the high dam. And um, the high dam was... Um, constructed in order to keep uh, people's ho homes from flooding and to bring more water to people, etc., which sounds great on the surface, but um, it was kind of like a cleansing effect. So the people that had their, their houses next to the Nile, every season, it wasn't like a disastrous flood, but every season water would rise up and um, they would have to move temporarily, then they would come back down. Um, but it kept the, inner, the it kept the water flowing through the Nile into the pyramids, et cetera, et cetera. And when we were there, we realized that uh, when we were in the subterranean chamber, we realized that water would come up from the Nile into the subterranean chamber, and then it would be um, transported into the queen's chamber, then up to the king's chamber. And there was an alchemical process that would take place with this water that would turn it into energy. Now, I don't know what the, um, what the, the alchemical process is, or if the water was transferred as liquid, or if it was transferred in a different form, but I know that uh, the crystalline makeup of the limestone within the subterranean chamber is something that Chris Everard actually uh, pointed out as um, 
um, pointed out as uh, being the right type of crystal to create that different energy. But anyways, that's neither here nor there. We're talking about two two different things now. But you know, now that I'm saying it out loud, I'm I'm thinking to myself, um, and I'm 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 getting the thoughts of the movie Total Recall. You know, when they go out to Mars and they're like. And uh, he's like, um, uh, turn on the reactor, Quay, turn on the reactor. I'm wondering if perhaps the pyramids and uh, a couple of other sites, um, the free energy aspect of it anyways, is actually a um, free energy device that once turned on changes the construct. Like in that film Total Recall, um, they were controlling everybody by controlling the oxygen levels on Mars. Once the reactor was turned on, then Mars had oxygen, and it broke the control of the corporations. Could it be the same here? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, that, I don't think that's part of our mission here. We're not here to turn on any reactors or do anything like that. But we can speculate on why those reactors are there. But um, back to the time travel thing. Um, there was something going on with, with Tut. But uh, he was a young kid, and he was assassinated at the age of 13. Now, um, the Mandela effect of this is that he was assassinated at the age of 19, which um, is completely different than what Egyptologists remember, what most people remember. Um, so I think that there was some kind of shift going on there. And um, I'm wondering uh, if maybe that's a, a point uh, that we that we need to access um, when we go back to either get information, change an event, you know, do something like that. And you know, what's interesting about time travel and the Mandela effect is we're seeing changes now within the time space. And we call them Mandela effects. Everybody recognizes these. But at the same time, we're talking about making changes in the past. So I wonder if the changes in the past have already been made and now we're just playing this all out. I mean, when we went to Egypt, we knew we would be able to access the temples. We knew we would be able to access the pyramid. We knew we would be able to do all of that. I mean, we even knew that the entire world would know that we were there and that people would know that something was going on there. When we when we brought down the rains for three days and caused a freaking historic flood in Cairo that was knocking down bridges, knocking down buildings, um, people were getting fired from the government. I mean, this was on record, you know, on on video. And then we did the same thing at the Temple of Hatshepsut. After we activated that pyramid, boom, huge storm. We went to Abydos again activated that temple and rain started coming down um and it was the first time in 15 years that there was rain in abydos so you know maybe it was all coincidence i i don't think so though i mean there were there were a lot of people on facebook putting putting their intent watching on the live stream and it's really remarkable because it couldn't have been done at any other time i mean you know, if we would have done this 10 years ago, I don't think we would have been able to live stream from these ancient sites. But now that we're, we were in 2018 at the time, uh, we were able to actually live stream all of this. And I think it was through that live stream that we were able to create that energy source, that we were able to create enough intention. And I think it just goes to show it doesn't take very many people. It just takes a, a few hundred people. That's it. Uh, setting their intentions. A few hundred of the right people setting their intentions and we can watch things just really really shift and really just change um so this next site um is very interesting um i saw this site a while back and at first i thought maybe it was a different site but i was like no 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 um it was the site that i saw in this vision and um it was a very obscure site it was one that I wasn't even familiar with, but now that I'm looking up different sites and I'm, I'm looking at them from all around the world, I'm like, oh, okay, I recognize where, which site this is, and it's, it's, it's a very obscure site. But um, I talked about, uh, I've talked about this last night, and I've, I've talked about this many times before, but um, in 2012, I encountered this triangle being that was beaming time travel schematics free energy, schematics, all kinds of stuff into my consciousness. And it was very adamant about giving me the information. It was like, take it, take it, take it. You'll know what to do with it later. Take it, take it, take it. You'll know what to do with it later. And um, it was, 
you know, I didn't think much of it. And now here we are faced with the possibility that we have to astral travel, not only through space, but also through time itself. And it's like, oh, well, you already have all the know-how. <laughs> you already have the knowledge. It was already given to you many years ago. Um, and you already have the team. You already have everything you need. Now, again, it all falls on us getting our shit together, fixing our bodies, strengthening our resolve, et cetera, et cetera. And so, yeah, it's really interesting, but really understanding the dynamics of this. The bootstrap paradox. Why do they call it the bootstrap paradox? Um, it's funny because yesterday they were talking about rebooting. We're rebooting the matrix, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we hit the reset button in Egypt. But I, I think that we need to hit the reboot button as well. It's two different activations. And so you reboot. Then you have the bootstrap paradox. So I started thinking aloud, and I'm like, reboot, bootstrap paradox. Do we introduce a, a bootstrap paradox into the time stream? Or do we remove a bootstrap paradox from the time stream? And is that rebooting? If we're rebooting... Maybe we're reintroducing a bootstrap paradox into the time stream some way, somehow. I mean, hell, maybe just our transfer of consciousness and our very presence there will be a bootstrap paradox. Hmm. Have to be careful, though. Have to be careful because, from what I understand, if time is manipulated so much to the point where it could no longer find its path. I mean, the way that uh, there was a book and uh, the way that they described uh, time is that uh, manipulating the time stream is like throwing a pebble into the river. And as soon as that pebble goes in, the river of time moves around it and takes its normal course as soon as possible, as soon as, as, soon as it, it, it moves around the obstruction. Um, but if that obstruction is so big that time cannot go back to its normal course quickly, then it is the rock or the irritant itself that is expelled. And so that's a trap that um, we have to be aware of. Anyways, I'm just thinking out loud now. So kiss the one you love right now. You never know when the last time is going to be and we'll see you even further beyond the veil.